I'm Dr. Salil Kandwala, and I'm the medical director at Advanced Urogynecology of Michigan. Let us talk about what is a refractory overactive bladder. So refractory overactive bladder is a condition where a patient complains of urinary urgency, frequency, or urgency incontinence that is beyond her control, and she has failed at least two medications and behavioral therapy. So the most important thing that we try to do initially is to see whether the diagnosis is correct. Sometimes patients may state that they have urgency and urgency leakage, but they may have actually stress incontinence. So it is very important to make sure before embarking on management of refractory overactive bladder that our diagnosis is correct. So let's just do a little bit of an overview of the anatomy and the physiology of bladder function. As you can see in this picture, looking at a woman from the side in profile, head is here, feet are here, the front is here, the back is here. This is the bladder right here, which stores the urine. And this is the urethra that brings the urine to the outside. Behind this is the vagina and the uterus on the top and the rectum at the back. So that's the typical normal anatomy in a female pelvis. The kidneys, one on each side, which is situated in the lower back, they drain the or they filter the blood and make the urine. And once they produce the urine, it is then transported by these two tubes called the ureters into the bladder, which then acts as a storage. So here is where the ureters open up. They pour the urine into the bladder and the bladder stores the urine until it is time to release like in this case here. This is controlled by the nervous system and also the bladder and the urethra work in sync where when the bladder contracts, the urethra relaxes and vice versa. So what happens in a child when they have, a child has just pees in the diaper is as the, this is the bladder by the way, and this is the urethra and this is the spinal cord. So when the bladder is filling up, it'll send a signal to the spinal cord saying, hey, I'm filling up and I gotta go, I've gotta go, I've gotta go. And then an immediate reflex goes back to the bladder saying, all right, you can go. And the bladder contracts and another reflex goes to the muscles of the urethra to relax and the urethra opens. So as the bladder contracts and the urethra opens, there is urination. And that is why a child needs to wear a diaper. But as the child gets older, the brain starts taking over. So this is the brain, this is the spinal cord, this is the bladder and this is the urethra. So again, that reflex is still there. I've got to go and another reflex that wants to come back and say, okay, go. But now as the child gets more mature, the frontal cortex, the intelligent lobe recognizes that no, I need to go to the bathroom. I just can't empty my bladder right here. My parents go to this bathroom and they urinate there and I need to do the same thing. So this frontal lobe then inhibits or sends a signal to stop this reflex arc. It is, a, it is a very powerful signal that goes from the brain, comes down through the spinal cord and says, no, you cannot go. And so the brain blocks the bladder reflex and therefore it controls the leakage or loss of urine. But over time, something happens. Either the reflex becomes very strong and overcomes the inhibition from the bladder or from the brain, or the brain's inhibition becomes just a few milliseconds slower in coming down the pathway. And that's just enough for the bladder to contract. So of course, a person in her 40s, 50s, and 60s, she's much more mature and she knows that she has to go to the bathroom, but she can't help it. And that's because of this problem either the brain signal has slightly slowed down or the bladder reflex arc has become extremely powerful. And when that happens, the bladder just squeezes and contracts and urine leaks out. And that's the overactivity of the bladder. So what we have done initially is done the history, done some testing, and probably you've undergone the pelvic floor therapy, one medication, a second medication, and you're still having the problem. Now again, remember, these medications are there to help, and this is the initial treatment option. That doesn't mean that if this initial plan of action, which is stated here, 
If that doesn't work, then all is lost. There are a lot of women who have ongoing symptoms of urgency and urgency leakage, and there is still significant treatment options available to them. And that's listed in these advanced therapies down here. So let's go over those. So what we may have you do is, again, repeat the, the history forms to see how bothersome it is. Maybe we'll do an exam to make sure nothing has changed. Have you do the urinary voiding diaries to see how much you're urinating in a 24-hour period and a three-day period. And then we may repeat the urodynamic testing to see exactly what is happening with the bladder and the urethra as you are having this urgency leakage. Then let's talk about the management. So we talked about these advanced therapies, which are listed three. So we may, as I mentioned, repeat this initial process and make sure that we have the right diagnosis before we pr proceed with these complex treatments. The first is called PTNS or percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. So what happens here is there's a small little 34 gauge, extremely tiny acupuncture needle that is positioned above the ankle joint and it sits there and it causes a little bit of buzzing in the sole of the foot. When we sense that the stimulator is left on for about half an hour and the patient is reading a book and after half an hour, we take this out and she goes home. So the advantage is that it is a simple office procedure. It uses a very tiny needle, which almost you know, barely breaks the skin, almost bends before it can actually break the skin. It's a short procedure, but because it is temporary, the patient has to be in the office once a week for about 10 to 12 weeks, and it has essentially no complications. Now, when we talk about success, this is very important to understand. Success essentially is defined as 50% improvement in the patient's symptoms. What does that mean? If the patient is having urinary leakage about eight times in a day, then 50% or better would be three times or lesser. So now if she is leaking three times or lesser, that means it's a 50% improvement and that's considered by most studies as a success. So please remember, it is very important to understand what are the goals and expectations and what we mean by success. So our success, when I say that this has, like for example here it says 70 to 80% success. So 70 to 80%, what that means is 70 to 80% women will notice over 50% improvement in their symptoms. That means the same lady, if she was going eight times and leaking eight times in a day, then she has a 70 to 80% chance that she will leak three or lesser times, which is a 50% improvement. I hope this makes sense because success sometimes is considered as cure. Some people may think success means, oh well, once I get this treatment, it's over. That means I will be bone dry, I will have nothing, no leakage at all. That's far from the truth. What our goal is to at least improve it by 50%, anything more is great. That does not mean that you cannot be completely cured. All I'm saying is when you look at the results of these studies, when they say 70, 80, 90%, what they mean is that 80 to 90% of women in that particular study had at least 50% improvement in their symptoms. So yes, nobody wants to leak. And if you're leaking three times instead of eight times, you may not be very happy because you're still leaking, but that at least is an improvement than what it is right now. So that is what I called expectations and understanding realistic expectations. So once we've discuss this. Now let's look at PTNS. So that has 70, 80, 70 to 80% of women will notice at least 50% improvement in their symptoms. This is when it was pitted against a medication, Detrol LA, it was found to be similarly successful. As we talked about the major advantages, no medication associated side effects. I mean, there's very minimal to no complications except that a pinprick that you get in the ankle just or about the ankle joint. The disadvantage is, yep, we've got to come to the office once a week, and that could be a problem for especially working women. But what we've done in our practice is that we have modified this 
So you could come either early in the morning at 7 a.m. or sometimes late in the afternoon. The other uh, procedure, which is also an electrical stimulation, let me go back to this, I'm sorry, to the uh, how does this work? So what happens is when they're stimulating it, it's stimulating a nerve called the tibial nerve and the tibial nerve goes up and the root value or the origin is from the third sacral root of the spinal cord. It's the same area from which the bladder nerve arises. So by stimulating it here, you're crowding the impulse at the spinal cord at that S3 level and therefore modulating the impulses coming from the bladder and that's how it controls uh, the bladder overactivity. Now when you talk about inner stim, inner stim neuromodulation, neuro is a nerve, modulating is regulating it. So neuromodulation therapy is similar to the um, PTNS, but the only difference is that this is a permanent option and not a once a week or just a half an hour option. So what happens is again, remember I was talking about crowding those impulses. Now look at this, this is where the bladder is, this is the urethra. So this is a signal that's going from the bladder to the spinal cord and says, hey, I've got to go, I've got to go. And then the reflex that comes back and says, okay, you can go. What the inner stim does is it inhibits it. By using an electrical stimulation, it stops the bladder nerves from stimulating the brain by inhibiting, as you can see the minus sign. So it stops it, stops it. And what it does, it you see a plus sign, it plus sign to the nerve of the urethra. So it makes the muscle of the urethra strong. By tightening the urethra, it will automatically relax the bladder at the same time, the nerves are not able to go up the brain and therefore it blocks it. And that's how this inner stim works. So we have two types of doing it. One is an office procedure and one is an operating room procedure. Office procedure is called PNE, percutaneous nerve evaluation. And in the OR, we do it as a stage one and two. So let's talk about this. When we do as a PNE in the office, it's done with the patient laying on her belly there is done under completely under local anesthesia where a small needle is placed very close to the tailbone, way below the spinal cord. And the correct placement is confirmed by asking you to feel, see if you can feel any vaginal muscle or rectal muscle contraction. And we may be able to see a slight flexion of your toes. It's a very thin gauge electrode that's left in place and then it is taped to the back. So here you are. This is where the tailbone is. This is the buttocks. You're looking at a woman on her belly. This is the back and this is the buttock cleft. And these are two buttocks up here. And you can see that the tiny little electrodes, one on each side that's left in and connected to the neurostimulator. What, what with this one, with the stimulation, the patient cannot shower and bathe for about two days, just sponging, especially the front sponging avoid any brisk movements because it's a very tiny lead and it can get easily dislodged and then it won't work. And then we'll see if there is improvement. So if there is greater than 50% improvement, then we go with, the good thing is we just go to the operating room once for stage one and two. But if there is less than 50% improvement, then we may have to do the stage one. And then if that is successful, we can go to stage two. So why, why would we do the stage one if the PNE fails? Because the stage one has got four leads, as you can see here. One, two, three, four. So the PNE had only one point of contact, so only one electrode, whereas the stage one lead has got four electrodes. So now you've got four points of contact with the nerve. So there's a higher probability that this will work. Second is you have a flange here. This flange, once it's in there and we check with x-ray, there is no way that this thing can move. So once it's placed in and we know that this is placed correctly next to the nerve, we leave it there after some tests, we look at the x-ray, and once we know it's okay, the patient has at least about two to three weeks to check it out and see if it's working or not. That's the beauty of, it, of stage one, where she has more time to check it out, especially when you need in certain cases where not only overactivity of the bladder, but also when they have overactivity of the bowel. So that's what this says, it has four leads, 
stage one involves a permanent lead with anchors and we've got a greater trial period. So this is how we place it and this is under, done under in the operating room under sedation where the patient is laying on her belly so you don't really feel anything as I'm doing this procedure. It takes about 15 minutes to half an hour to do the procedure and then you are home in the next uh, hour or so. If that is successful in about two to three weeks, you come back to the operating room and we just open up that incision that we had made to place the lead and we put this battery. Just to give an example, the size of the battery by showing you a coin next to it. So you know that it's not a big battery, it just sits in the buttock fat and this constantly stimulates the lead. So there is a constant electrical signal going in. Now remember, you don't feel this signal. This is below threshold, so you don't perceive it, but it's doing what it's supposed to do, which is blocking the bladder nerve from coming back and being recognized at the same time by stimulating the nerve around the urethra to make, make it nice and strong. So the patient is, and for the stage one, as I mentioned, it takes about 15 minutes to half an hour. For the stage two, it takes about 15 minutes and the procedure is completed. For both the cases, there is no admission. You come to the OR, it's done, and you go home within an hour, and really there's no downtime. You could go back to work the next day. From the side effects of this procedure, there could be some discomfort at the buttock site. There is some movement of the neurostimulator, the battery that we put in if the buttock fat dissolves. And the, if this stimulation, that if the electrode is very, very close to the nerve, then even slight stimulation may be recognized by the patient as some buzzing in the leg or in the vagina. An infection of the surgical site, just like any other incision, you have incision on the buttocks and that can get infected, but it's very unlikely. So that is about inner stem. So when you look at the success of the inner stem, that also has a 70 to 80% 70 to chance of 50% improvement in the symptoms. In other words, 70 to 80% of women will state that they had at least 50% improvement in their overactive bladder symptoms. The advantage of inner stem is it could also help in women who have associated bowel leakage or some women who have urgency leakage, but they also have urinary retention where they are not able to empty the bladder. The other advantage of inner stem therapy is that it can be there for a long time the battery may not have to be changed for almost three to five years. So the good thing is it's once it's placed, it may be there for a very long time, continue to be effective, and three to five years can go by and you may continue to do well. So that's the beauty of doing the inner stem procedure. The third option is the bladder Botox therapy, and this is done in the office under local anesthesia. What Botox does, it's just like what it does with the wrinkles, it partly numbs certain aspects of the bladder wall, and therefore it prevents the bladder contractions from moving around and causing an effective bladder contraction. It takes about 15 minutes to actually perform the procedures and patients go home within the hour of the procedure. So it's a completely local anesthesia procedure done in the office, within a few minutes it's over and the patient is home. So how it is done is that we pick and map certain aspects of the bladder where we put this in and when we put the local the Botox inside we create a bleb under the bladder lining and this is where the Botox goes in and stimulates or works on the muscle and therefore it paralyzes certain aspects of the bladder muscle wall and prevents the propagation of an effective contraction that could lead to urinary leakage. It may need to be repeated in a few months if the symptoms return, but the success rate is 91% achieved response by two months and 95% by six months. So it is very effective. Again, remember the same premise applies, at least 50% improvement in the symptoms, not 100% cure. With the Botox, the side effects are less than 5% may complain of difficulty emptying the bladder and may need to catheterize for a short period of time. The infection, bladder infection risk is 8 to 10% and that is why we give them an antibiotic before, during and after the procedure for a few days. So major advantage is that you do not have to take a medication. There is no side effects of medication. It's done in the office. You do not have to go to the operating room and it can be repeated if the symptoms return. So that is the advantage of Botox 
and at the same time the efficacy of Botox and Interstim are very very similar. Finally, the goal is to improve the symptoms. We may not be able to cure it. Remember, overactive bladder is dependent upon several factors. Is your, if you're a diabetic, is the diabetes well controlled? If you're a hypertens hy hypertensive, do you take any fluid pills which could make urine production become very high? Or if you have congestive heart failure, that could also affect the bladder functioning. So there are so many other factors to consider and therefore, our goal is to improve the symptoms. If we can cure it, fantastic, icing on the cake. But if we can improve it, that's our goal. Finally, we want to improve the quality of life and see if we can therefore get off the pads. Pads really don't help. And in most situations, we can get off the pads or come down to maybe a panty liner once or twice a day. Key is that you cannot, give up on it, what you have to do. You still have to do the dietary modifications, fluid management, the things that we talked about when we discussed about overactive bladder, which is making sure that you observe and be careful of how much you drink, avoid caffeinated beverages, go to the bathroom every two to three hours when you are awake to empty your bladder. Even if you do not feel like going, just go. Pelvic floor exercises you must do to improve the tone of the urethra and relax the bladder. May have to take a medication along with and do some of these refractory overactive bladder management protocols. All in all, overactive bladder and refractory overactive bladder is very common. If medications don't work, all is not lost. There is so much more that we can do. These three treatment options that I just discussed to you with you are very, very potent options. They are very effective and at the same time, they are very simple to perform. None of these is fraught with complications. Even if you did the inner stem procedure, it takes me only about 15 minutes to half an hour to do it. The only reason I have to do it in the operating room is because of x-ray and sterility to place the pacemaker. Otherwise, it is a very straightforward procedure. And remember, it could last for about three to five years. And even after that, all I have to do is replace the battery, which is literally a 10 to 15 minute procedure. So all these three options are very effective. You can pick and choose which option you want to do. The leg stimulation, the advantage is it's done in the office. But the drawback is that you have to come here once a week for the next 10 to 12 weeks. For the inner stem, you have to go to the operating room or we could do it in the office, but at least once you have to go to the operating room to place the entire battery and the permanent lead. So that's the drawback, but the advantage is that it could be effective, especially if you have any bowel symptoms or retention symptoms, and it could last for a longer time period. The third option being Botox can be done in the office it's very effective. At the same time, you know, if the symptoms come back, we could always repeat it. So, you know, it's up to you. You can pick and choose which treatment option you want. There's one treatment option you never heard me say, and that is wearing a pad. That's absolutely not a treatment. So make sure you give up on pads. Pads are not good because they just hide the problem and they weaken your muscles. So you know the pad is there, so it becomes a crutch. You rely on it rather than your muscles and your muscles weaken. So that is not an option. So our three options we just discussed, and I can tell you this, that once we make sure your diagnosis is correct and we adopt one option, maybe one doesn't work, we go to the second, the second doesn't work, we go to the third, but somehow we can clearly improve this problem. So now that we know the different treatment options available to you for the management of this condition called refractory overactive bladder, where medications have not worked well enough, and we've made the right diagnosis that you truly have this gotta go, gotta go problem or the urgency incontinence, let's look at this table which basically summarizes these three options. So let's scroll onto this, let's make it a little bigger. Slideshow, look at the slideshow, current slide. All right, so let's look at this. So look at the inner stem, the first Botox, and then the PTNM, which is the leg stimulation, 
percutaneous tibial neuromodulation, it's called, which is uh, the three different techniques. So the mechanism of action, how it works, so this works directly on the back, on the spinal nerve, the S3 nerve. The Botox acts on the bladder and it, it uh, sort of paralyzes those bladder nerve pathways. And the PTNM, the leg stimulation, also works on the S3 nerve, but indirectly because it works from the leg. And this is more direct at the S3 near the back. This is more coming from the leg. Now, where is this procedure done? The inner stim, the first part is done in the office, whereas the first, then the remaining part is done in the op outpatient procedure room uh, because we need x-ray for that and has to have a sterile room. Botox procedure is done in the office and sometimes I do it at an outpatient procedure, but more likely than not, it's done in the office. As you saw, it's done completely under cystoscopy. The PTNM, which is the leg, the nerve stimulation in the leg, that's done in the office. How long does the procedure take? The inner stem procedure for the in-office part is 15 minutes, and then the first and the second stage is about 45 minutes. If we had to do the first stage first in the operating room, then that would take about half an hour, and the second stage is about 15 minutes. So basically, the first stage is about half an hour, the second stage is about 15 minutes. Um, the Botox takes about 15 minutes maximum to do, typically about 10 minutes. The leg stimulation, you know, you have to be getting that stimulation for half an hour. How often is this done? Inner stem, if it's working well and the battery is doing well, then every three to five years, the battery may just need to be replaced, which is a very quick 15 to 20 minute procedure just to change the battery, which is now not working. The Botox, maybe every six to 12 months, but again, it's done in the office. The leg stimulation has to be done once a week for 10 to 12 weeks and then every month as maintenance. The success is basically similar across the board. Remember what I mentioned, success is at least 50% improvement in your symptoms. It doesn't mean it's completely cured. It is at least 50% or better. Complications, is, incidence is very is rare. Botox is also rare and the leg stimulation is very rare. So what's the type of complication you may get? Maybe you may get infection at the site or pain at the buttock site with the Botox difficulty emptying, which is again a very low likelihood and a bladder infection, which is less than 10% chance. With the leg stimulation, you know, it's really cannot get into any trouble there. Any other benefits that may be there besides helping with the bladder? Yes, with the inner stem, it also helps with bowel leakage and urinary emptying problems. So that's one good thing about inner stem. When you have, you know, urinary complaints and bowel complaints, and this would help. The Botox, um, nothing else but the bladder and the leg stimulation, it could potentially help with the bowel, but hasn't been tested yet. When can this not be used? So, you know, when would you not do it in what type of patients? Well, if a woman needs an MRI of the, of the back, for example, she has back problems and she needs MRIs, then we cannot do it because this involves placement of a metal. Botox cannot be done in women who are not emptying the bladders well and have retention or they have frequent bladder infection or certain muscle disease. Um, and the leg stimulation is not, it's hard to do if someone's on a blood thinner because you don't want to keep uh, poking a needle every week if she's on a blood thinner. What are the advantages of this, these procedures? For the inner stem, it helps the bladder and the bowel leakage. If it's once it works, the battery just needs to be changed every three to five years. So it's good to go, you know, for three to five years. It's a very short outpatient procedure and it works from the bladder standpoint for both got to go problem and also difficulty emptying. From the Botox standpoint, it is a quick office procedure. Patient is completely awake. It's done under local anesthesia. It's a short procedure and if need be, it can be redone every three to six months. The leg stimulation also is in office. There's no anesthesia, about half an hour, no prep, no limitation. You can do whatever you want to do before and after. The, the disadvantage of this, of the inner stem would be, it needs to be done in the operating room. It needs anesthesia. It cannot be done in women who may need back MRIs. From the Botox, it cannot be done if she's not emptying her bladder or has frequent bladder infections. And the PTNM, you know, you cannot really do it in women who have blood thinners 
or um, it's hard to do it, especially in someone who has a lot of swelling of the lower limbs or significant varicose veins. And you know, the unfortunate part of the leg stimulation is that the woman has to keep coming to the office frequently. So if you look at it all in all, it really depends upon what you want and what fits you the best. You know, as you can see, one has some advantages, the other has some other advantages. So ultimately, you know, it's your choice. You really cannot go wrong. The only thing I would recommend to you is do something. Do not just suffer in silence. Do not resign yourself to pads. Do something. Any of these would help you. And you never know. Sometimes we may have to do, do two. Let's say I've done the inner stem and that's doing okay, then I may also need to do Botox. So, you know, you never know how it works. The bottom line is if we can get better, we may not get perfect, we, not, we, not, we may not get completely cured of incontinence, but if we can get better, then why not?